Hi, good evening. Uh, it's an honor to welcome to Harvard's Kennedy School Forum tonight three remarkable public servants who are also instructive role models for students considering how thinking individuals can have impact for good on issues of war and peace. President Obama was in uh, last week in India where he praised the f uh, India's founding leader, Mahatma Gandhi. And among Gandhi's observations that seared in my soul is his answer when he was asked the question, what worried him most? He replied, the hardness of the heart of the educated. So our guests tonight uh, demonstrate in their lives the fact that hard-headed analysis is not incompatible with an empathetic heart. Our speaker is at the forum tonight is the third ranking official at the US Department of Defense, the Under Secretary for Defense Policy, Michelle Frodnoy. She serves as the principal advisor to Bob Gates, the Secretary of Defense, for all matters on the formulation of national security and defense policy, from the raging wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, to the conflict in Pakistan, to nuclear weapons, to North Korea, to China, to Haiti. Think of an issue where US military forces are taking action or shaping some environment, and Michelle is the person responsible for formulating the policy and plans. Here at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, we're especially proud of Michelle, who was a research fellow here from 1989 to 1993. And just before joining the Obama administration, Michelle was the co-founder and president of Washington's newest and most lively think tank in the national security arena, the Center for the New American Security. She's also a graduate of Harvard College. Michelle will speak to us for about 15 minutes summarizing her insights into some of the major national security challenges the nation is grappling with today. She'll be followed by two remarkable colleagues, both of whom we're proud to say also have thick Harvard connections. Paula Dobryansky served from 2001 to 2009 as President George W. Bush's Undersecretary for Global Affairs in the Department of State where she had lead responsibility for an array of foreign policy issues, including democracy, human rights, refugee and humanitarian relief, environment, as well as Tibetan issues and Northern Ireland. And she's now an adjunct fellow at the Belfer Center here at Harvard. Our cleanup hitter is our own Megan O'Sullivan. Megan is the Jean Kirkpatrick Professor of International Affairs here at the Kennedy School. And in the second term of the Bush administration, she served as Deputy National Security Advisor with primary responsibility for Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, for those of you interested in how individuals can make a difference, Megan was one of the key people, uh, as the cooks in the kitchen, as, as she sometimes says, uh, who uh, in 2006, uh, saw a situation in which it looked inevitable that the U.S. would lose in Iraq and came up with the surge as an alternative policy, which leaves us in a much better place today. She's also the author of a number of books. The most uh, relevant, I think, probably for tonight's debate is something called Shrewd Sanctions. So we've got a terrific lineup of people tonight. We're especially proud that Michelle has come from Washington and spent most of the day back here at home. And so we're looking forward to what she has to say. Well, thanks very much for the warm welcome and introduction, Graham. It's actually wonderful to be back here at Harvard. Uh, I, as Graham said, I had the privilege of being an undergraduate here and later a fellow at CSIA here at the Kennedy School, and I have many fond memories 
from attending forum events like this to uh, getting up very early in the morning to row out of Weld Boathouse just across the street to discussions and debates with wonderful professors and mentors like Graham Allison and Joe Nye. One of the things that I've always cherished about Harvard is its sense of history. As you know, since Harvard is not exactly shy about this fact, uh, this is indeed the oldest university in the United States, with a founding that predates American in independence by some 140 years. Harvard's, Harvard's graduates uh, have always and profoundly influenced the life of this nation and its institutions, including its armed forces, from the colonial era to the present day. In fact, the involvement of Harvard students and graduates in our nation's military began very early, before we were even a nation at all. They fought in the American Revolution, from the nearby battles of Lexington and Concord all the way through to the end of the war in the Army of George Washington and the Navy of John Paul Jones. In the Civil War, Harvard students rushed to the Union cause. 55% of the class of 19, uh, excuse me, 1860 fought in the Northern Army or Navy, 68% of the class of 1861. In the two world wars, this university was a center of military training, and its graduates were instrumental to victory in both conflicts, including, of course, war World War II Navy veteran John F. Kennedy, the future president after whom this great school of government is named. In short, this university, by virtue of its own history, is a fitting place to talk about war, the sacrifices of war, uh, the purposes of war. Specifically, I want to talk to you uh, tonight about America's current wars, our fight in Afghanistan, and our diminishing but still significant military presence in Iraq. Let's start with Afghanistan, which is now our nation's largest and most consequential foreign military engagement. With the surge forces that President Obama has ordered into Afghanistan now fully in place, current U.S. troop strength there is nearly 98,000. These U.S. troops fight as part of a diverse coalition uh, that includes 47 other nations in the International Security Force, or ISAF, that work in partnership with our Afghan allies. Taken together, the ISAF nations, which include not only traditional NATO allies like Britain and France and Turkey, but also newer partners like Azerbaijan, Malaysia, the United Arab Emirates. They contribute about 40,000 additional troops and a wide range of civilian resources, bringing the total strength of the international coalition in Afghanistan to some 140,000. These forces serve alongside more, more than 260,000 Afghan security forces who are now taking the lead in more and more operations. As you know, there's been a significant amount of discussion lately here in the United States and in other coalition nations about the purpose and progress of the war in Afghanistan and whether or not this war is worth the cost, both human and financial. These costs have led many to wonder why we, why we, we remain in Afghanistan and how can we hope to achieve an outcome that is worth the sacrifice. As President Obama said in his speech last December at West Point, I am convinced that our security is at stake in Afghanistan and Pakistan. This is the epicenter of violent extremism practiced by Al Qaeda. The president explained, this is no idle danger, no hypothetical threat. As we've seen in the months since the president spoke at West Point, it is certainly true that terrorist threats can come from any number of places around the world such as Yemen, where Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula hatched the recent plot involving advanced explosives aboard cargo airplanes. However, there are a number of factors that make the Afghan-Pakistan border region an especially dangerous source of terrorism and instability, and that explain why President Obama has made such a steadfast commitment to disrupting, dismantling, and defeating Al-Qaeda and its related networks, and to denying them sanctuary in these countries. One of the factors is the region's history. It is in Afghanistan and neighboring areas of Pakistan that Al-Qaeda's senior leadership and its affiliates have plotted and prepared for many of the most vicious and elaborate attacks, terrorist attacks of the past decade. The September 11th attacks, and of course, but also, uh, also major attacks in London, Madrid, Bali, Mumbai, and elsewhere. While we've made genuine progress against these networks, disrupting their operations and eliminating key leaders, 
They continue to actively plot new attacks against us and our allies, and they remain capable of striking the American homeland. There is nowhere else in the world with such a concentration of Al-Qaeda senior leaders and operational commanders, and such an established record as a crucible of international terrorist activity. This is a record that we ignore at our peril. It would be short-sighted for us to simply assume that Afghanistan would cease to hold any attraction for Al-Qaeda and its associated networks if we departed without reversing the momentum of the insurgency and ensuring that Afghanistan has the capacity and the capability to secure its own country. And it would be equally short-sighted for us to ignore the deep interrelationship between Afghanistan and its neighbor, Pakistan. Consider the following. The border between these two countries is more than 1,500 miles long. That's about the distance between Boston and, say, Dallas. Furthermore, the border uh, bisects the region's Pashtun community of about 40 million people. In other words, the geography, the ethnic makeup of the border region mean that Afghanistan and Pakistan are truly conjoined, their fates intertwined. In a clear-eyed recognition of these realities, the administration's strategy has emphasized the needs to address both sides of the border, to see the region's security challenges as an integrated whole, even as we recognize the different circumstances and needs of both countries. As we work with Afghanistan to increase its ability to ensure security nationwide, we are also working to help Pakistan contend with the insurgency that has taken root in the Fatah and the Northwest Frontier provinces. As President Obama said at West Point, we will strengthen Pakistan's capacity to target these groups that threaten our countries and have made it clear that we cannot tolerate a safe haven for terrorists whose location is known and whose intentions are clear. But this administration has also made clear through the words and actions of our president and the government that the United States will no longer make the mistake of seeing our relationship with Pakistan as narrowly as we have in the past. Pakistan is a nation of 184 million people, the sixth most, most populous on earth. It has a growing middle class, enormous human, human potential. We seek to help foster its continued economic and democratic development, as well as its stability. But make no mistake, our broader effort against violent extremist networks in Afghanistan uh, and Pakistan depends for, us, our, for its success on our maintaining a robust American and coalition troop presence in Afghanistan, at least until Afghan forces are able to take the lead for providing security. Removing or reducing our forces prematurely would ease the pressure on Al-Qaeda and the terrorist syndicate in the region. It could very well restore a vital sanctuary from which they have attacked us before. The potential consequences for global security are quite high. This is one reason why the war has drawn support from so many other countries. They see that this is not just America's fight. They see that it is not just a regional matter. What happens now in Afghanistan and in Pakistan has much broader ramifications. The presence of nuclear weapons in Pakistan only heightens the importance of denying al-Qaeda and related networks any lasting foothold in the region. We know that these networks actively seek nuclear weapons and we have every reason to believe that they would actually use them if they obtained them. But just, as this war is just, just because this war is necessary does not mean that it's easy or that success will come as quickly as we would like. As you may know, the administration is conducting a review of our progress in Afghanistan and Pakistan and our efforts against al-Qaeda. The purpose of this review is to assess the implementation of our strategy, not to revisit the strategy itself. The administration strongly believes that we have the right strategy, the right tactics, the right resources, the right leadership in place to achieve success in Afghanistan. But it will take time. It will require patience. But there are growing signs, tangible signs, of hard-fought progress. General Petraeus has reported that the insurgents' momentum has been arrested in much of the country. In Regional Command South, we are making steady gains in clearing insurgent strongholds in key districts near Kandahar, a Taliban stronghold. For example, an American Brigade combat team recently supported an Afghan-led mission in the Taliban enclave of Malajat, outside Kandahar. With Afghans heading up the operations, we were able to break the insurgents' hold on, a on the community. 
IEDs have been removed, markets have reopened, children are going back to school, which would, not, which would have been totally impossible only a few months ago. In Regional Command Southwest, we have expanded our security operations beyond the central Hellman River Valley and have largely seized momentum from the insurgency in this area. Our progress is certainly a tribute to the excellence of our troops. Our special operations forces in particular are operating at an extraordinary tempo and putting unprecedented pressure on the insurgents. I know that this has caused a stir. It caused a stir this week when President Karzai called into question the special operations campaign. But he called for, and I quote, a plan whereby the Afghan capacity increases and whereby the NATO presence decreases to the extent that we can provide our own security. An increase in Afghan, Afghan capacity and a deliberate conditions-based reduction in the US and NATO presence as that capacity increases over time is precisely our aim. But this will take time. There are already signs of improvements in Afghan capacity. The campaign around Kandahar, where 60% of the forces involved were Afghan, are good examples of what we can achieve when there is close partnership between Afghans and our coalition forces. The Afghan Local Police, or ALP program, which was approved by President Karzai early this year and builds on the Afghan tradition of tribal and community-based security, has shown good early results. The ALP connects the central government to rural areas and helps separate the insurgents from the local population. It also offers a way to reintegrate former insurgents who've renounced violence. For example, Shindad district in Fara province, it was a long contested area that served as an important staging area for insurgents. In May of this year, uh, locals fought off an insurgent assault. And in September, government officials and local leaders swore in a new group of ALP members, including some former insurgents who had opted for reintegration. Attacks by insurgents in the area have declined consistently throughout the summer and early fall. And this is just one illustration of how the ALP program and the reintegration of former insurgents can transform an area in the lives of the local population. We're also seeing real signs of progress in the development of the Afghan National Security Forces. In fact, as, um, as of this past July, the Army and the police had exceeded their growth, growth goals three months ahead of schedule. And we are seeing steady improvement in both quality and retention of personnel. We expect these advances in local police and the national security forces to shift the momentum in our favor and the Afghan government's favor. They bring us closer to the objective that we share with President Karzai, an Afghanistan that is fully capable of providing for its own security, free of unwanted foreign involvement. Now these recent gains are real, but they are fragile and still reversible. There is a long way to go in Afghanistan, and innumerable challenges lie ahead. But we have seen before what happens when we abandon Afghanistan to its fate. This is exactly what we did uh, after helping the Mujahideen to defeat the Soviets. It is not a mistake that we can afford to make again. As the President said at West Point, we neither seek to, we neither, excuse me, we seek neither to occupy Afghanistan nor to leave it prematurely. We will seek a partnership with Afghanistan grounded in mutual respect, to isolate those who destroy, to strengthen those who build, to hasten the day when our troops will leave, and to forge a lasting friendship in which America is your partner, never your patron. This is a good point at which to mention uh, the now famous date of July 2011. That is the date that the President established to begin a conditions-based process of US troop withdrawals from Afghanistan. Let me talk about what that date will mean and what it won't mean. It will mean the end of the current troop surge and the beginning of some US combat troop reductions when and where conditions warrant. This will be dependent on a careful assessment of conditions on the ground and on the ability of the Afghan National Security Forces to take the lead in security in those areas. July 2011 won't mean the end of our commitment to Afghanistan, or even necessarily a reduction in the intensity of our operations, not by, a long, not by a long shot. In fact, we do not talk about an end date, but rather a transition process in which Afghanistan takes the lead in providing for its own national security. 
This week in Lisbon, our NATO allies and President Karzai will reaffirm our shared desire to attain that goal by the end of 2014. We envision a long-term NATO commitment to continue training, equipping, advising the Afghan National Security Forces if they want us there. We also have a commitment to build the U.S. and allied civilian presence to assist in Afghanistan's long-term development. We've already increased the American civilian contingent there by more than threefold to more than 1,100 officials from the State Department, USAID, the Department of Justice, and others. Hundreds of these Americans Civilians are serving side by side with our troops in the most difficult and dangerous missions to help improve the lives of Afghans and weaken the insurgency. While we see a long-term strategic partnership in Afghanistan, we also see a similar long-term commitment to Iraq, even as we are moving toward the end of our major military deployment there. Whether or not you thought the invasion of Iraq was a good idea in the first place, it is absolutely vital that the military phase of our operations responsible, uh, end responsibly and that we continue to support Iraq's emergence as a stable and democratic country. As Megan well knows, our military and civilian personnel sacrificed a great deal to achieve as much as they have in Iraq. The Iraqi people themselves have overcome enormous odds to lay the foundation for a nation that is sovereign, stable, and self-reliant. We are close to consolidating some very hard-won gains there and entering a new phase in our relationship with Iraq. On September 1, our military mission there shifted from a combat mission to an advise and assist mission, fulfilling the pledge that President Obama made in, his, in Camp Lejeune in February of 2009. This transition has been made possible by the improvement in the security situation. The Iraqi security forces have made great strides, and their development has been a significant factor in allowing us to draw down our troop presence. Even as this reduction has taken place, the security uh, situation has remained quite stable. The number of attacks overall has been at the lowest level since 2003 for more than two years. This suggests that the Iraqi security forces are stepping up and are increasingly capable of providing for internal security. While sectarian violence remains a significant concern, the nature of the threat from al-Qaeda in Iraq and other extremist groups is not what it used to be. The high-profile attacks we occasionally see in Iraq are sporadic, not systematic. Most importantly, they are no longer setting off terrible chains of retributive sectarian violence. They do not represent credible threats to undermine the government itself. Iraq has taken a long time to form a new government, which reflects divisions that are inevitable in a society emerging from conflict. However, last week, Iraqis took a major step forward with the announcement of a governing coalition representing Sunnis, Shia, and Kurds, and committed to a joint platform of political reform. More broadly, there is widespread acceptance of the legitimacy of the nation's political system. As intense and complex as the government formation process has been, Iraqis, Iraqis are actively seeking to advance their interests within that system, rather than supporting those who would try to tear the system down with violence. Over the first two years of the administration, we have drawn down nearly 100,000 forces from Iraq. Moving forward, we will continue our responsible drawdown in compliance with the U.S.-Iraq Security Agreement, while also laying the foundation for a long-term security relationship through a robust Office of Security Cooperation. I'd like to conclude uh, with a word on the role that many of you can play in helping this country meet its national security challenges. I began my remarks by talking about this university's impressive history of military service. And as you might have noticed, the timeline ended about the middle of the 20th century. That's because starting around the Vietnam era, uh, fewer students from Harvard and other prestigious universities chose to serve in the uniformed military. Some of these universities have significantly cut back their institutional ties to the military, including sponsorship of ROTC and NROTC programs. This estrangement between the military and some of our finest institutions of higher learning has deeply negative consequences for all involved. As Secretary Gates recently said at a speech at Duke, today's all-volunteer military is an exceptionally well-educated, experienced, 
broadly diverse force that in some ways is quite representative of the nation as a whole. But he also noted that the, burdens of today, the burden of today's wars is borne by a very small slice of the American population, about 2.4 million active and reserve service members out of a nation of 300 million people. That is less than 1%. And within that less than 1%, certain key segments of our society are here, are bearing an even more disproportionate share of the burden and sacrifice. As Secretary Gates said at Duke, there is a risk over time of developing a cadre of military leaders that politically, culturally, and geographically have less and less in common with the people they have sworn to defend. This would not be good for our military, and it would not be good for our nation. Among the segments of our society currently underrepresented in the military are many of those who have benefited most from the freedom, security, and prosperity that our military defends. Now, if you think I'm talking about you, you're right. That is why I'm asking you, students and young faculty of this great university, to consider serving, public service, whether it's in the uniformed military or elsewhere, active duty, reserve, Many of you have an interest in security policy. Perhaps that's why you came here tonight. But I'm asking you to think beyond the well-worn paths that lead from Harvard to the world of think tanks and policy offices. I'm asking you to think about directly contributing to one of the most impressive and diverse institutions in the world, the United States military. I have some knowledge of the people who have chosen such a course. My husband, a Cornell graduate, served for 26 years in the Navy, both active duty and reserve, retiring as a Navy captain. His career spanned the military, business, and now again, public service. So why not consider a similar path? That's my challenge to some of you tonight. It's certainly not for everyone, but it's also not something that you should see as off limits to you. The national security challenges before us are truly daunting, perhaps more daunting than in other, any other uh, era in recent history. And we need smart, dedicated men and women like you to find a way, some way, to serve. Thank you. So Paula is going to uh, say what she agrees with or disagrees with, but I don't think we're going to find on this panel much disagreement with Michelle's final call to service. No, I'm not in disagreement. Um, first, let me say how pleased I am to be here this evening and with such a distinguished panel um, of uh, all who I've known and worked with here on this panel, and I'm just very, very pleased to, to be here. Let me begin with first by saying that the policy overview that um, uh, Michelle laid out I think is a very sound one, a very realistic one, and one that is rooted in our core national security interests. So I'd start with that, that point. Several things struck me as she delivered her remarks. The first being that, that at the end of this week is the Lisbon Summit. And what came to my mind as she was speaking was in fact about the issue of Afghanistan especially uh, being on the agenda and the discussion of that summit, and where we, with our allies, were looking at what the next steps are. And toward that end, I guess there are two points I'd make. First, I do think that the summit is an excellent opportunity to register our strong commitment, as you've done, uh, a long-term commitment uh, uh, in the case of Afghanistan, because as we know here, a number of our allies are looking at taking an alternative course. Now having said that, even though they may be taking an alternative course, I think that this forum does provide an excellent opportunity to lay down the markers of our strategy very clearly, very definitively, and secondly, to also still appeal to our allies because they are important to us and our security alliance is critical is to underscore the ways in which they can still, even though they've made other choices, to come forward and still provide support for the situation on the ground. Let's again taking Afghanistan. In this case, what am I referring to? The assets that they have to deploy in bolstering soft power. 
Uh, many of them are already involved in the ground in this, in, in this capacity, and I think they can, t can continue to be involved in a very critical way. Because I think, as we know, we have hard power assets, but for long-term peace, stability, being rooted in Afghanistan, it is essential to have a foundation, a foundation of civil society, a foundation of economic growth, a foundation that also tackles corruption. And in these various vital areas, I think the summit provides an opportunity to galvanize the support from those that may move in other directions, but can certainly help in this capacity. The other point that I wanted to make is I wanted to underscore something that Michelle mentioned. She talked um, about Pakistan. Pakistan, I wanted to elaborate a bit more because I do think our policies and our approach towards Pakistan is absolutely essential and key in the dynamics of uh, the evolution of peace in Afghanistan. Toward this end, I think she laid out uh, uh, very clearly the kinds of areas that we need to be focused on in terms of uh, Pakistan's focus on Fatah. And also, the administration has focused on economic ways of bolstering Pakistan and helping galvanize them and providing incentives so that we are in sync on our strategy in uh, the, uh, if you will, the eradication uh, of, uh, of those uh, terrorist uh, forces. So I wanted to underscore the role that Pakistan plays here. I think it's absolutely essential and critical. We are players, the alliance are players, but also the countries in the region also each have a role to play, and in particular, uh, Pakistan, uh, certainly in this case. Finally, I, I will just say that um, with regard to Iraq. Let me just transfer over the same point that I made in Afghanistan. When I look back on Iraq and in terms of the evolution and the development, I do think that the combination of hard power and soft power makes a difference. I'm personally a very strong proponent of soft power, having learned that here from my professors here at, uh, at Harvard. Um, in this case, when you look at where Iraq was, where it is now, I do think that the kinds of assistance that has been rendered, and let me pick out a different sector, not only our allies, but by the way, public-private partnerships. So many private partnerships, non-governmental organizations that have played a very, very key role on the ground in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, institutions, organizations like the National Endowment for Democracy, the National Democratic Institute, you know, uh, the International Republican Institute, and I could go on and list a whole variety, have really targeted so many sectors, whether it's health, whether it's basic public services, whether it's political training, all of these areas have mattered. And finally, I'll just conclude on this uh, note. I, I wanted to mention um, uh, a, someone who's now affiliated with Harvard and who's been a strong supporter of uh, this kind of an agenda is the former ambassador to Afghanistan, Saeed Jawad, who's here in the audience today. Um, he certainly was one of, I would say, the biggest supporters of in Afghanistan combining those types of strategies that are absolutely essential for a sustainable peace and stability. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me also begin by thanking you all for coming tonight and thanking my co-panelists. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with you and especially thanking Michelle for coming here and spending the day with us. Um, I have three points I'd like to make that just to contribute to this conversation that stemmed from the remarks of my colleagues, but I'd like to begin somewhat predictably by endorsing your final call to service and to assure you, as I know you know, our classrooms are filled with students who have served in a variety of capacities and are eager to find ways to serve going forward. So I'm sure many of them here and elsewhere will, will heed your call and I look forward to that. Um, again, let me uh, mention three, three things. Um, the first is uh, the US role and the importance of psychology. When I think about what I have learned from being involved in Iraq and Afghanistan, over the last years, I think, well, the United States brings many things to these theaters. It brings military power, it brings financial resources, it brings technical expertise, it bring, brings diplomatic heft. 
But one of the things that I certainly undervalued before I became involved in government was the importance of setting a psychological environment. And what I mean by that is that we are looking, we meaning the international community, broadly speaking, we are looking to Iraqis, to Afghans, and to others to make very, very hard decisions about their future. And we can't make those decisions for them, but we can help create a climate in which it is easy, easier for them to choose a decision that may not uh, be one that is closely aligned with their sectarian group or their tribe and prioritizes the nation. It, it helps, we can help them choose an option that is better for Afghanistan as a nation or Iraq as a nation. Um, we're, we're asking people to make decisions that could be very, very costly, um, not just financially, but primarily in terms of security and their future, and that the United States helps create a psychological environment for them to make those decisions. And so often we can think about troop numbers and dollar numbers and numbers of diplomats, but at the end of the day, what does it all add up to? Does it add up to a psychological environment in which Afghans, Iraqis, and others feel that they can take the risks that we want them to take to create a better society? Um, and I think that that certainly is one of the issues behind the timeline that Under Secretary Flournoy uh, elaborated on, and I welcome that elaboration and, and hope that it is heard, heard widely, particularly among our Afghan and Pakistani colleagues. The second point I'd like to make is just building, um, is consistent with Michelle's comments and building on Paula's about the soft power issue. Um, I think in our classrooms, many of us, we talk about the importance of the civilian side of the equation. And we're all very well trained to articulate that coin is 80% non-military, 20% military. But in reality, I think we all know, and nobody more than my co-panelists, know that our civilian side still falls short in many ways, despite very, very serious efforts on the part of the Obama administration and the administration before to build that civilian side. And I just wanted to interject um, into our conversation just the importance um, of keeping at that, um, either by your own personal service, but also um, to our Congress, to recognizing that allocating money for the civilian side of our efforts is every bit as important as allocating resources for the military side. Um, certainly, the civilian side and its, in, its ability to partner and work in a whole of government approach with the military side will be key to success in Afghanistan, but it's also key to consolidating the good things that have happened in Iraq over the last few years. If you talk to Iraqis now, they're most concerned, well, they're concerned about a lot of things, but one of the things they're concerned about is are they going to be able to maintain a strategic relationship with the United States? And we have an interest in, in seeing that that relationship is, has many, many dimensions, not just a military dimension. Lastly, let me just conclude um, with a big topic, and I'll just say two things on it, and that is this whole issue of what are the lessons from Iraq to Afghanistan? Um, we, could, we could spend you know, months discussing this, and I'll just tell you one area that I, I worry about people drawing the wrong lessons and one area that I think is really ripe for drawing lessons. The first is on reconciliation. Um, I think in some ways, as we talk more about reconciliation in Afghanistan, we all acknowledge that that has to be a key component to um, a successful uh, future for Afghanistan. I think um, there's a danger that we have the Iraq experience in our mind. And if we look at what happened in Iraq, reconciliation was very much part of an improved security environment and the politics that both of my co-panelists described. But the fact is that a lot of those people came into the political process without the Iraqis in power having to make major changes to their constitution or the political order. So it wasn't so much a negotiation where people had to make really hard decisions about what was fundamental to the new Iraq and what was something that could be given away. It basically was insurgents and others accommodating themselves to a new Iraq. Now that's not irreversible, but that is, um, I think that in some ways suggests that reconciliation in Afghanistan might be easier than it probably will be. Because in Afghanistan, I think there will have to be harder conversations and tougher decisions made about what is, uh, what is something that can be compromised and what is uh, uh, uncompromisable, if that's a word. 
Where I think there's a lot of room for drawing uh, good lessons is on the issue of transition that the Under Secretary mentioned. Um, we talk about how the combat role ended in Iraq and shifted to a supporting and training role in Iraq and how significant that's been. But that actually masks what was, in fact, a very sophisticated evolution of the relationship between the United States and the Iraqis, particularly on the military side, but not exclusively. A movement from where the US during the period of the surge was really the frontline actor to one where the US was a supporting actor to now a behind the scenes actor. And this was a constantly shifting transition. It was very, very um, evolutionary, very fluid, whatever the the nice word I would use to describe it. But it was one that was much more um, gradual, halting, um, constantly taking assessment about, is it possible to move forward? Do we have to move back? Um, and it took, I, it took a, a lot of uh, calibration, I guess is the word. And I'm sure um, as the Obama administration thinks about transition in Afghanistan, I know that's uh, something that is on people's minds. They're thinking about a model that would reflect that kind of sophisticated um, sequencing of both civilian and military relationships. So let me stop there and turn it back to our chair. Thank you. So Michelle, I don't know if you want to say anything about any of the points made. I mean, one, one that I know you've been in the middle of is Pakistan, where the administration has been trying to build a strategic partnership. And I think if I remember, you and the Pakistani defense minister or the whatever, the Tango group there. Can you, can you say a little bit about how, how, that, uh, how that works in the Pakistani piece? I think we have um, been investing in trying to develop a uh, full-fledged strategic partnership with Pakistan. Um, we have had strong areas of cooperation on counterterrorism. One of the things that few Americans know is that over 30,000 Pakistanis have actually died, um, either in the military or civilians who were targeted, um, in dealing with these militant and extremist groups. So they are paying a heavy price. Um, we are, we believe that the more we can invest in Pakistan, reassure them of our commitment to their stability, to their economic and democratic development, the more they will be able to shift their strategic calculus in a way that buys into the stability of the region uh, and does not adopt some of their historical um, approaches to sort of hedging their bets, if you will. Um, so the strategic partnership has, um, it's very important. We believe it's, it is beginning to pay dividends. It's not going to happen. That shift is not going to happen overnight. And we are going to continue to, investing, uh, to invest in the, in the cooperation to try to find uh, more and more ways that we can uh, cooperate to bring greater stability to the region. Let me uh, invite the audience to... Uh join the conversation. We have two microphones on the, on the ground floor, and there's two microphones in the loges here. The rules are you get, uh, get up, stand by the microphone, introduce yourself, uh, put your questions succinctly. Uh, it ends with a question mark. We have only three speakers tonight, but we have, a, I think, a great opportunity for about uh, 20 minutes to have a serious conversation, so please. My name is Eugene Colgan. I am uh, studying for a doctoral degree at Brandeis University where I'm studying nuclear proliferation, or more specifically, ways to prevent it. Um, since tonight's topic is broadly women and war, I was hoping to ask um, Under Secretary Flournoy and Ambassador Dobryansky and Professor O'Sullivan about the challenges and opportunities that women face in public service, just to pick up on under Secretary Flournoy's call for public service, the challenges and opportunities for women in America in the area of public service and specifically in the area of national security. Thank you. Well, I would just start by noting how much um, things have opened up. My first tour in the Pentagon, I remember uh, hosting a lunch for senior women in the Pentagon and all nine or all ten of, of us you, yeah. <laughs> fit at one table. Now, if I issued a similar invitation, we would burst out of the dining room. So um, are we where we want to be? Uh, no. 
Um, or is it much improved? Yes. And what really gives me great um, confidence and uh, inspiration is are the couple of generations right behind us. Um, the women who are now serving at the deputy assistant secretary level, at the office director level, who are recently out of graduate school, have several years of work experience, but are really coming into leadership roles. Um, there you see just tremendous talent, um, gates wide open, and, and I think um, uh, lots, of, lots of progress in terms of creating openings and opportunities for women. I'll say my own assessment is I think that the situation has really uh, opened up very widely for women. There are lots of opportunities. But I'm going to give a flip side of this. I remember when, uh, as an undergraduate, I was looking at what area I wanted to go in, and I decided early on I wanted to go into international affairs. The fact of the matter was there actually weren't a lot of women who were going down that path. So I'll say that maybe some of the numbers at that time you know, didn't match up because some weren't going into the Foreign Service, some weren't going because maybe that wasn't the educational path that they pursued. Um, I went uh, as an undergraduate to the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and then did my graduate work here at Harvard. And I have to say that, uh, for example, uh, also one of my professors, Samuel Huntington, um, he was very big on internships, and I became an intern at the National Security Council. There were lots of doors that were opened up if you wanted to go through it and you also had the expertise. So I'm going to add to your question and say, basically, I think that I've seen a market shift where a lot more women are pursuing careers in this path where they hadn't uh, once uh, before, at least during my time in, in, in school and beginning my, my career. But I think there are a lot of opportunities that are afforded now. Let me make just one uh, footnote and then see if Megan would comment as well. But uh, just for advertising, uh, the forum is going to have an event on November 30, remembering Sam Huntington's intellectual contributions with Fareed Zakaria, one of his students, and you know Cohen, and usual suspects. But in any case, so that's on November 30th, if you're just doing your date, but Megan, would you comment on this, General? Sure, I, I just uh, agree with Michelle and Paula and also note that I have benefited from women in generations above mine that I think did push some of those doors open, so I've been very thankful for that in my career. Um, just to address a slightly different angle, which might be in the minds of some of you, um, and that is the question of should women go into Middle Eastern studies, and should they look to work in national security in the Middle East? And I would wholeheartedly say yes, um, that I have found this to be a very uh, fruitful and interesting and, and gratifying place uh, to build relationships and to, to work with people in other parts of the world. And um, it could be from all kinds of reasons, but I have found, particularly as a Western woman, that I have the advantage of being able to sit with the men and being able to sit with the women. So I often get to see both sides um, of a society that is sometimes only closed uh, to one sex. Well, maybe if I can press you just a little further. So Megan, after uh, the invasion of Iraq, uh, was part of the first wave and was uh, trying to deal with the politics of Iraq and then was there for two years, I guess, before you were back at NSC working on policy, but then when there was difficulty putting a government back together again. Even when you were here, you went back there for several months. Tell us a, a story or two about why it's difficult for a woman trying to do business in Iraq. Well, I actually found that not. the advantages were much greater than the difficulties. Um, and when I think about the ability to be effective in the Middle East, in Iraq in particular, but it's also true in Afghanistan. I really think about um, the key factor is the ability to build personal relationships. And I think many of you have experienced that in, in your different forms of service. So that's the key thing. There's some people who might say women are better at that than men, and I don't know if we want to get into that debate. Um, but I definitely found that that was the key thing. That was the thing that enabled me to go back and um, try to help out at different junctures in time, is having those relationships. Um, and, and some of them come from uh, throwing yourself in at a point of great uncertainty. So I think when I look back and I think about 
some of the relationships that I built with Iraqis that are still very important to me today. I think they got a good start because I, I went, you know, in the first civilian convoy to Baghdad um, in April 2003, and I arrived before a lot of the Iraqis who actually came from exile returned to Baghdad. So we were on the ground together in these days that were both, you know, terrifying and inspiring. And so, you know, being in the crucible with people, whether you're a man, a woman, a, an American, an Iraqi, a French person, any, any, any of this, I think, uh, has more of a bearing on gender. Um, that's been my experience, per se. Please. Thank you so much, ladies, for coming. I have a two-part question. One is the important correlation between poverty and um, terrorism. I remember working in the northwestern frontier province, and um, and as you know, I, I, as I believe, much terrorism comes out of poverty in many of these areas. The only social services presented are from you know Hezbollah and many groups such as those. And, and after the earthquake in Pakistan, I remember the relations between um, America and the Pakistanis uh, improved quite a bit. Um, they were very appreciative. We were one of the first responders, our government, to the tragedy there. So I wanted to get your insight on um, the role you know, we're serving there to eradicate poverty and help in the civilian side of things. And then also, on behalf of a colleague here, um, an officer in the army who's a returning Iraqi uh, veteran, she was very alarmed at the lack of assistance for and um, investment in women and children in Iraq. She felt that we were doing a good job of educating the men and kind of, you know, training, uh, doing job skills training and whatnot for the men in Iraq, but not the women. And, and she uh, fears for the, uh, you know, future security of the country um, um, in, in this way. So I wanted to know from you what we're doing as a government um, to, to help the women and children in Iraq. I'll be glad to take, may I take the, la the last part because mm -hmm. I thought as you were asking your question, my first visit to Iraq was because there was a conference, the Voices of Women of Iraq Conference. And uh, starting literally in 2003, many women in Iraq were trying to organize and reach out and set an agenda for themselves as to what they wanted to achieve and how they wanted to achieve it. I have to say I was very impressed First, with the fact that they were very definitive about what they wanted to achieve. I mean, it really ranged from everything from educational uh, opportunities that they wanted to further and solidify, although they had some educational opportunities, at the same time, even to the sports, area of sports, and their ability and desire to participate in sports. Um, I will say that uh, over these past years, I think that there's been actually a vigorous campaign and outreach, fundamentally through government funding many NGOs that are on the ground and that are very specifically working with the ministries of the women's ministry, with also uh, the uh, uh, various women's organizations, for example, legal organizations that have been set up, also even garnering support for women to run for political office. I remember meeting a number of Iraqi women who had never had anything to do with politics and were actually having the opportunity to come forward and to be able to do this. I will say that in my view, a lot of the good work is really done by a lot of grassroots organizations who are on the ground, who are working very closely with Iraqi women and trying to advance um, uh, their goals and objectives as they have set forth for themselves. And resources have been attached to that. There's, in fact, at the State Department, Ambassador Milan Revere, um, uh, she has uh, been designated as the uh, 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 ambassador for women's issues at large. And uh, we have worked with her um, over these years, both when she was in the private sector and now in government. And this has been one of the priorities uh, that uh, both government and private sector-wise has been established. If I could, I'd like to speak to your question about the connection between poverty and terrorism. I think on an individual level, where I don't think we find a strong correlation between sort of economic background and those who choose terrorism um, or become to, involved in terrorism, I do think there is a correlation um, in, in the sort of ungoverned and undergoverned spaces or places um, that tend to be more ripe 
uh, grounds for becoming safe havens for extremist uh, groups or violent extremist groups. They tend to, when you look across, whether it's the Fatah, parts of Yemen, Somalia, you tend to find uh, populations where there are very deep and abiding grievances between groups empowered and groups disaffected or disempowered, uh, where you find um, only limited access for certain portions of the population to uh, basic services, where government is, not see is seen as more predatory than a provider of services, um, where you create fertile soil for other groups to come in and espouse an extremist ideology and gain sympathy, um, safe haven recruits, and so forth. So, I think what it, what that has told us is that we need to take a very whole of government integrated, integrated approach to fighting terrorism. As our own special operations commander, Admiral Olson, has said, you can't kill your way to victory in counterterrorism. You have to address some of the conditions that create fertile soil for extremism to take root and grow. Oh, please. Hello and good evening. I'm um, hoping to take advantage of sort of the broad title of this evening's talk. Um, I, for one, was very happy to hear us discussing Iraq. Let me get you to introduce yourself. My apologies. Me. I was happy to hear us discussing Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm a second year MPP here and I'm writing my thesis on, on governance and its impact on the Army Corps of Engineers work in Afghanistan. So. However, we've got a bigger topic at hand, and I think that this is a place where one of the beauties of being at the Kennedy School is you have a very devoted to public service audience, and we have a lot of female students in the room. We have a lot of different interests. I know Professor O'Sullivan also teaches a very well-loved course on energy. Professor Allison has obviously gotten quite a few of us worried about nuclear proliferation and terrorism over the course of this semester. What other big ideas, particularly our guests, Ambassador Dobransky and Undersecretary Flournoy, are you most excited about? You each have gotten to have much bigger perspectives than just these two current conflicts. What's the next big thing? What else should we be putting our time and energy behind mm -hmm. in a school of government? Well, uh, I'll pick up on that. Uh, one of the areas that I think is really important and very worth looking at is what's happening in the Arctic. We have witnessed in the Arctic a warming trend, and as a result of the warming trend, you have passages that are being open. This has on one hand uh, commercial opportunities, but also a race for resources. It also has other ramifications, in fact, for many countries, including our own, that border the Arctic. So actually, I think uh, uh, that there are going to be a number of challenges. The United States has not signed yet the Law of the Sea Treaty. We should be a signatory to the Law of the Sea Treaty. And I think that if we do become a signatory, I think that actually there are going to be a lot of interesting challenges as well as uh, debates and discussions over that arena, which is going to loom larger. So for those looking for new research topics, I would say take a look at uh, the Arctic. It has energy ramifications, commercial ramifications, environmental ramifications, and uh, questions of sovereignty. I would agree with that. I would also nominate uh, two more, one regional, one functional. The regional would be Asia. When you look at uh, our economic prosperity, our economic interests, the changing power dynamics in Asia, the rise of China, the rise of India, um, the, the reconsidering uh, of the sort of international norms governing everything from maritime security to uh, commerce and trade, I think Asia is going to be a focal point for our strategic interests for the next several decades. So I would put a lot of emphasis there. The other one that I've been talking up all day and I'm trying to recruit people to this cause is cyber. Um, cyber is a completely uncharted conceptual territory. It's like nu the nuclear domain was before shelling, before Herman Kahn. Um, we don't know how to think about it. Most of our inherited frames um, fall short or completely mislead us uh, when you, you know offense, defense, deterrence, escalation, dominance. It doesn't work very well in cyber. So I think thinking through how we integrate um, cyberspace and our thinking about cyber into not only the economy but our national security thinking will be critical. Good, yeah. e excellent question, and yeah. I think great topics for people to yeah. chew on. Up in the loge, please, and introduce yourself. Yes. 
Hi, uh, uh, good evening. My name is Sagal Absher, and I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. Um, in January of 2011, um, we will, it will mark the 20-year anniversary of the collapse of the Somali government. Um, and so my question, you know, thank you for the insights into Iraq and Afghanistan. My question for the panel is, um, what are the prospects for U.S. Um, engagement or re-engagement in, in the Somalia situation? Um, I'd love to hear about that. We, we are um, actually just completing a review of our Somalia policy. Um, it's an obviously extremely complex and vexing situation um, with great um, humanitarian uh, consequence. We are redoubling our efforts to work with the transitional government to support the UN force Amazon and to increase their capacity to provide greater security for the TFG. We're also going to be seeking to engage the other semi-independent or autonomous areas, Puntland, Somaliland, other neighboring countries to try to build their capacity to try to stabilize the, the area and combat um, some of the, the more militant and extremist groups. But it's an extremely difficult set of uh, problems and, and, um, and frankly, uh, you know, there, our leverage is limited, but what we want to try to do is build up the capacity and the will of those who are more able to leverage the situation and make a difference on the ground to help make them more effective. Please, in the Hi. lodge. Hi. My name is Tara Maller. I'm a Belfer Fellow of the International Security Program and a PhD candidate in MIT's Security Studies Program. Um, we spoke a lot about the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we haven't yet sort of shifted gears at all to other issues like proliferation with Iran and North Korea. I was wondering, um, being that the Obama administration sort of ran on a platform of increasing diplomatic engagement and talking with adversarial states, um, I was wondering if you could comment on why we haven't seen more of a push for diplomatic engagement in the context of other strategies as well, like sanctions um, that we ha have seen more of, but we haven't really yet seen any new initiatives. Uh, in, in Secretary of State's Secretary of State Clinton's confirmation hearing, um, there was a lot of discussion about by Senator Kerry and others in Congress about pushing for moves like trying to open an interest section, more cultural and educational exchanges. And I was wondering if you have any insights as to why some of these things haven't been happening or, and why we haven't seen the push that was spoken about um, sort of during the campaign period. I'll take the first if you want to take the second. <laughs> the, um, on the, on the nonproliferation front and particularly engagement there, you know, the Obama administration came into office with a very strong um, desire and uh, effort uh, to engage uh, Iran um, on its nuclear program and the fact that it's out of compliance with the Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, out of compliance with a number of UN resolutions um, and its obligations with the IAEA. Um, that engagement was quite serious. Um, it was largely rebuffed. Um, but the fact that we made such an effort at engagement, and it was in good faith, um, allowed others in the international community to join with us when it came time to push for sanctions. And so you had Russia as a very strong supporter of sanctions, China, um, others, the EU, um, and that's part of what's making the sanctions effective. Now it remains to be seen whether that will be enough to change Iranian calculus on, on its nuclear weapons program. But I think the fact of our engagement actually made um, the international effort um, stronger. I think in other areas, whether it was reinvigorating the Nonproliferation Review Conference, convening the Nuclear Security Summit, I mean, the nonproliferation area has actually been a very strong line of diplomacy for the, for the ad administration, but as you said, we can always do more. If I uh, heard you in your sort of your second part of your question, the what I take away from it is something that I think all three of us in our comments uh, have in a way referred to that I think has constrained uh, the, if you will, uh, the uh, State Department, and that is resources. In fact, I think in your opening comments, you really referred to that. That's been one of the challenges. I believe Secretary Gates has been very, uh, 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 direct on this issue, as has Secretary Clinton 
about the need for not only addressing our defense and military related issues, but looking at the integration of these components and how critical it is also putting resources into the diplomatic side, which involves uh, many of the soft power elements that we've, we've discussed. So I would simply say, I'd start with the fact that there still needs to be a vigorous redressing of that issue and uh, I know that uh, the State Department has emulated the Department of Defense with its quadrennial review. And I think part of that message and the outcome, at least of the direction of that review, is the dire need for resources, whether it's at the State Department or, for that matter, at the Agency for International Development. Right now, the percentage of those monies are very, min very minimal. I think uh, uh, most think that it comprises a substantial part of our budget. It does not. Michelle was actually commenting on this at lunch today, so I don't know if you want to say anything more on that topic. Well, I think, I mean, one of the things that I think, um, you know, uh, those who serve in government find in this day and age is that it's, it's difficult to find a challenge that you can effectively address with just one instrument of national power. And, and what's needed is a much more whole of government approach, an integrated approach. And yet, when what we find uh, as a nation is we invest in one instrument, we put the military on, on steroids, and everything else is on life support. Um, now, I, don't, I think a strong military serves our national interests very fundamentally and very well. But it doesn't serve our interests to not be able to deploy civilians in an expeditionary manner to do dispute resolution, diplomacy, economic assistance and development, other kinds of, of work that are so critical to actually either preventing a crisis from becoming a conflict situation or post-conflict to help a society come out of conflict and consolidate our security gains to reach at political objectives. So it is something where the politics of this on, on Capitol Hill are extremely challenging. It's much more difficult to get resources for the civilian side of the house than the military side of the house. And yet it complicates, that imbalance complicates our ability to achieve our objectives. Uh, Iraq, the transition to Iraq is in a case in point right now where the military side of the transition is very well funded. The civilian side of the transition is not. And it's a real challenge for coherent policy going forward. We have time just for two final questions. This gentleman and this lady, please. Thank you. Uh, namaste, salam, shalom, salem, a salute. Uh, my name is Andre Sheldon. I'm a peace activist. And I study women and war. And that's why I'm here tonight. And in particular, I'd like to uh, submit that to address the issues of nuclear disarmament, of uh, psychological environment and civilian activity, and the answer that you just gave, that there's a hard imbalance between the government and the, and the civilians, that uh, the, an initiative of nonviolence would be a way to uh, go forward, because it would be a people movement. And a people movement would be political. And it would be an interaction of government and the people. And uh, in particular, uh, right now in uh, the West Bank, there's a documentary out coming December 3rd in this area called Budris. And the people of Israel got together with the people in the West Bank. And uh, they promoted nonviolence with women leading the way. And so uh, there's. Uh, some strength and 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 there's if women take the lead in a movement of nonviolence then we add the empathetic heart that you alluded to in the beginning and uh, we also then uh, mobilize people because the uh, when Obama took office he reached out with the olive branches and in his first uh, television interview he said we are not enemies to the Islamic world so uh, to get to my question uh, Thank you, I know. Uh, that uh, uh, the, if there was a movement, uh, and uh, I've 
been working on, uh, and because of my study, a global strategy of nonviolence, if anyone's interested, uh, with uh, an initiative called A Call to Women. If there was a call to women, in not just the US, but in all the countries, because in Afghanistan, the, there's evidence of the women getting together, but would the government be open to the uh, movement of nonviolence led by women, and could they work together? That's the question. It's probably to you, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, I mean, I think that there are, um, there in, over the course of history have been many times where movements coming, grassroots movements coming out of civil society have been very powerful proponents of positive change. I mean, our own experience with the civil rights movement, um, our, you know, the experience of the nonviolent movement in India's formation as a nation. I mean, there are many examples um, of this in, in history where there is a very, um, sometimes initially difficult and then productive dialogue between civil society and, um, and uh, governments. Um, so I would just, I would say I think that there, there, that's a, that's a recognized, um, there are rec many recognized cases. Um, hard for me to speculate to, to know exactly what you're, what you're envisioning. Um, but, I, but I think that a dialogue with elements of civil society on how to move forward on, on the full range of national security issues from war to peace is, is a positive thing, particularly in a dem democratic society like ours. Okay. The last question has to be from our colleague Tony Shays. Tony was Undersecretary of the Air Force, uh, one of the people early opening some of the doors that were mentioned to many of before. So, Tony? And now just a lowly professor That's right. <laughs> at Fletcher. Um, Michelle, I credit you with being the parent of um, PDD 56 and the whole concept, and we worked together a bit on this here at the Kennedy School, the whole concept of civil military planning, which now seems to me to be more important than ever under the kind of irregular warfare and the COIN strategy. Um, what kind of power can you put behind it? Are you putting behind this concept? And that really goes to the question and discussion just prior to the last question on the short, and one you must have had at lunch, on the shortage of resources. But within the government itself, in the planning phase, knowing that we failed to do that in Iraq, what are you able to do now? Well, I think in Afghanistan, you'll be happy to know, I, I just was in Kabul for a review of the civil military campaign plan. Um, and. Uh, there have been several iterations. It is something that we actively use. Actually, there was one developed. There were plans, such plans developed for particularly the in, in Iraq. Um, the I know I'm not sure when they started, but they were certainly there by um, the later stages. The uh, in Afghanistan, and it's also being used in a more proactive way as we contemplate potential future crises. We are trying to bring together people to think through them in a sort of whole government approach, identify everything from strategies to authorities to resources and so forth. So I think the planning piece has come a long way since the days of uh, Presidential Decision Directive 56 in the Clinton administration. What hasn't come with it as fully as we've been discussing is the, the resourcing to fully enable the civilian elements of those plans. Well, unfortunately, uh, since we could continue this conversation, I, I would with fascination for a long time, but local work will say we've come to the end. Let me say again what an honor it's been to have such uh, three such great public servants here and how much we especially appreciate Michelle taking so much time out of an incredible schedule. So thank you very much. I, I, should, I, I forgot one thing. I should also advertise that tomorrow night in the forum, uh, Admiral Mike Mullen, who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, will be here. So if you just 
sit in place, you'll get a chance to hear that tomorrow. But that's not till tomorrow night.